Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Crop Life Retail Week. Paul Shrimp here with Eric Spilligoy. How are you? I am good, sir. I guess, uh, you know, this late in October, this, I guess, what we refer to with non correctly politically as Indian summer in Ohio. I mean, it's about 80 some degrees today and a little warmer than it's been in the last few uh, few days, but uh, I did see that, uh, lo and behold, this weekend, I think we're only looking for highs in the 60s as a cold front moves in, so it won't last. Yes. And highs in the 60s are fantastic, honestly. We'll take that pretty much any October it comes along, but uh, yeah, they, I look out the window, the leaves are still green. We've had no trace of uh, color change or anything, so uh, it's been amazing, but we'll take it. Yeah, I know. I've got plenty of leaves of fallen in my yard. My son was out raking for me yesterday. So, and I'll have you know that I almost mowed the entire lawn before he finished raking one pile in the front yard. But then there again, speed isn't his strong suit. As long as I get it done. That's, get that's all I cared about. The fact that I didn't have to try to plug the lawnmower with a bunch of leaves. <laughs> I hear you. So interesting week this week, we uh, saw that Bushel acquired uh, Grainbridge, which is uh, the Cargill ADM uh, 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 joint venture. Uh, and you know, Bushel's really been accumulating a, a lot of assets and <laughs> looking to grow its, its influence. And this certainly was a huge one. Um, uh, and uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that, how that goes going forward. But you know, as a tool uh, on the grain side, it's going to be hard to uh, it's going to be hard to beat when it comes to market market penetration and you know uh, access to growers and so forth. They've done a lot of work on that front, and it's it's really interesting um, to see what they've done. And if I'm flashing, it's because my light's going over. <laughs> and your dog's maybe and my your dog, dog is barking. So there you go. I guess the mail must be here. Yep. So you know. On the grain side, Bushel seems to be uh, be the leader here, one of the key leaders here, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll see how it comes out. Yeah, I know. Like you say, Bushel has been making a lot of acquisitions in the marketplace, and uh, again, their uh, their influence is growing. I know. I usually run into them at the Commodity Classic in uh, you know late late winter, early spring, whenever that has been held. So. Uh, it'll be interesting to see and talk to their folks there in person to find out, you know, between now and then there's a lot of calendars. So who knows, maybe they'll make more acquisitions and uh, I'll have plenty to discuss with them when I see them in person come early March. You bet. So what's going on in your world? Well, actually, one of the big news stories, uh, Paul, it broke uh, actually as we were getting ready to record this was uh I guess the uh, workers for John Deere have authorized a strike so that uh, as we record this, um, you know, the uh, folks that put together the John Deere tractors and other pieces of machinery for our friends who love green big pieces of iron are uh, actually not going to be on the job. They're going to be on the picket lines. Um, based on what I was reading, it was a contract that had been agreed to, but that 90% of the membership of John Deere's employees said, no, we don't like this contract. So, um, you know, I guess they had made some concessions over the last couple of years when times were lean for John Deere, but um, John Deere, like other companies, apparently is doing quite well financially these days and the workers would like to share in that uh, profitability and get some of those concessions they made back uh, in addition to a few other uh, perks as well. So, We'll have to see how this ends up, but I'm sure, you know, we've been talking a lot about supply issues. This, I'm sure, will not uh, make things any easier when it comes to uh, growers and retailers ordering pieces of equipment from our friends at John Deere. Well, those of us like you and me that grew up in the, in the Rust Belt and, and uh, saw the, the ups and downs of manufacturing can remember well uh, when things got, things were high and, and contracts were up. That was the time when the uh, uh, when the unions kind of felt the power and uh, went for went for more, um, and uh, so it's certainly not something, not a concept that's foreign to us. But it's been really some time in the U.S. since we've had a, a situation uh, like we have on the labor side, um, where the the workers are kind of feeling their oats a little bit. So we'll see how it comes out. But um, but really, a, a, an amazing development uh, 
and um, hopefully it gets worked out soon. Yeah, we will. Like you say, we will see. And again, since I mentioned the supply situation, uh, of course, one of the things that everybody's been talking about, the fact that there are many, many ships off the uh, West Coast that are just sitting anchored off uh, the ports waiting to be unloaded, but there is no space for them in the ports at the moment. Um, at last count, I think there were about 70 ships waiting to be unloaded at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, which uh, between the two of them get about 50% of the container ship traffic that comes into the United States. Uh, but I guess we do have some good news on this front, Paul. The Biden administration and the UAW for the workers at those ports have now agreed that they're going to start manning them 24-7 to try to undo some of the backlog of container ships that are waiting to be unloaded. So uh, with luck, uh, this will maybe uh, some of these snags in the supply pipeline that everyone's been talking about will start to unravel themselves as uh, workers are working not round the clock to get these ships unloaded and products are moving from the ports to inland where they need to be. Yeah, let's hope there's truck drivers to get those uh, get those <laughs> train operators get the that stuff across the country because I know that's another challenge entirely. Yes, uh, that's another issue entirely. Yes, but uh, at least at least the backup at the ports might be uh, you know maybe unclog that part of the pipeline. So that, every little bit will help, I'm sure. Yeah, let's hope so. So, uh, what anything else, sir? Is one other thing just to mention, of course, you know, it wouldn't be a video that we've been doing without uh, a reference to a, a uh, ag retail consolidation merger that has taken place. And this is one I just found out about, but actually took place back in April. Uh, our friends at Woolsey Brothers Supply, which was ranked number 100 on last year's Crop Life 100, have now sold their operations. Their three locations are now part of the nutrient family of companies. So, uh, you know, again, there was uh, another, another ag retailer from a Crop Life 100 acquired, you know, the number 100 acquired by the number one. So I guess there's some symmetry there. Uh, and we wish our friends who are, were at Woolsey Brothers, Herbert Woolsey and his, uh, his family well. Uh, but yeah, those, those, kind of, those uh, retail ships in Illinois are now under the Nutrien banner. Yep. My, boy, the Woolsey Brothers, that was <laughs> such an iconic name in, in the Midwest um, for, for, uh, for retailing. I can remember, you know, I remember Char Sign, our, our early, our protege who was with the company for now is still doing work with the company. Uh, but uh, she had been really through the formative years of crop life uh, and, and before that Farm Chemicals Magazine, uh, Talk about some of those early lists, and Woolsey was always a mainstay on the list, and and um, one of those folks that we go to for uh, for thoughts and information on uh, what's happening, and uh, know a good friend of Shars as well. So, uh, yeah, but definitely best of luck to the family as they move forward, and uh, and you know, sorry to see him go, but hopefully it's uh, hopefully it's a deal that worked out well for them, and they're they're set. Yep, I would hope so. So, Paul, now it's time for your favorite segment. Fun with numbers. Just nowhere to escape. I'm looking around. Just can't get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul. I've got a low number to hit you with. Actually, it's a range of numbers this week to hit you with. Uh, and hopefully you've been paying attention because all the everything we've been talking about up until now will hopefully give you clues as to what I'm referring to. So the number range, Paul, is one to three days, and your clue is U.S. transportation. Think about what we've been talking about. That should give you a clue. One to three days. What might that number number range represent? Mm -hmm. uh, so the number of days it takes from something in the West Coast to get to the Midwest, like, say, Furlan. <laughs> no. <laughs> and you might, might remember the second item or the third item we talked about was the uh, container ships off the co West Coast and waiting to be unloaded. I looked it up and on average, it takes one to three days to unload a container ship 
that is coming from Asia. And on average, these container ships have up to 10,000 containers on them. So you can tell that one to three days per ship, uh, if you add up 70 ships off the coast and you just portion about a day at a time, would take 210 days thereabout at maximum to unload all the ships waiting to be unloaded. But obviously there are multiple crews, multiple ports, so probably won't take quite that long because uh, 210 days is a heck of a long time from now to be waiting for stuff to be unloaded. But yes, on average, one to three days to unload a container ship in the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. So there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't say I've read a little bit about that. I mean, Long Beach, I mean, in that area, it was up to, I think, almost five to six days uh, with the backup, just be, yeah. because it's been so much slower. But uh, it, it's amazing to know, you know, when you, it, do, it does make sense when you think about it, because we are pretty close, but the Christmas season is pretty much set, you know? <laughs> I mean, whatever is coming is on a ship right now, and it's going to get here, and that's about all the supply you can expect to be available before Christmas, and, and who knows what that'll be, uh, whether it'll be everything that was ordered or part of what was ordered or whatever. So I don't know. I mean, you know, it's it, it's funny. It, it just kind of, it, for me, the, the commercialism's kind of ripped out of Christmas already. I mean, my kids are grown. My wife and I are like, man, eh, you know, we're, we're kind of on the down, down slide in terms of, you know, our materialistic, not that we had big materialistic desires, but it's just another, yet another reason just to, you know, take stock at Christmas, enjoy, you know, each other's company and don't worry about the, uh, the playstations and all that other stuff that may or may not get here. <laughs> We're fine with it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Paul, I know the older I've gotten, the more I look forward to the holiday season for the eating part of the equation. Uh, I love making a soup, you know, maybe potato or cream of chestnut, which I've talked about in videos past, or, you know, and of course, uh, cooking a ham and having some pierogies and couple other side dishes and just just making a nice little eat fest um the, the presents are definitely secondary and i know my son is older now so pretty much a few big gifts on christmas day that uh, electronically oriented which keep him occupied or maybe a lego that'll take him a couple of days to put together and uh, everything else is set so but yeah. like you said it uh, i know i've already made the christmas list of things to buy and i'll probably be ordering them here in Oh, I don't know, maybe two weeks, which is probably uh, about a month earlier than I normally get this stuff. But I just don't trust the supply chain. So I want to make sure to have stuff that I need to have in-house wrapped under the tree of, uh, here on time. Yeah. For us, it's just finding a creative way to wrap a check. <laughs> 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 put it in a big I don't box. Know, it seems it pretty pretty easy to put that in an envelope and just seal it up. But all right, Paul, if you wanted to wrap it, more power to you. That's a video I think I'd like to see an insert of in our videos going forward. You trying to wrap a paper check with wrapping paper. You'd be surprised <laughs> <laughs> how creative we can be. Oh, uh, all right, sir. Well. I think that's it for this edition of Crop Life Retail Week. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. If you have questions or comments about today's episode of Retail Week, contact us by email or Twitter or type your message in the comment section below. Your feedback is important to us. We'll try our best to address your thoughts in next week's episode. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel.